My job entails facilitation of the industry, which is a public transportation service. We actually produce 60% of the service to transport the public in the province. It's a cash business. And um, anything that deals with cash, especially in a day-to-day -day business, will have its risks. When you speak of taxi violence, it's just a transformation of political violence. The province, sadly, has quite a history in terms of political violence. As chairperson of a region, we would never have a month without our incidents. The only way to secure yourself is to have a security company. From the day of election, I've had to have six people on a daily basis. Sometimes you'd have a case of competition, and inside the taxi rank, the competition will bring about a crossfire of maybe even two different security companies one which is trying to secure the tax rent and the association defending its territory. You're inside the armory of Taxi Violence Unit, VIP Protection. We're a private bodyguarding company that does security for the taxi industry since 1996. In the late 90s, early 2000s, um, a lot of taxi killings, taxi drivers, taxi owners, chairmen, regional chairpeople. Um, it slowed down, I think, for many, many years. And then it's picked up again in the past year and a half, two years. It's all about money, it's about greed. Um, it's, about, it's about associations vying for each other's work. My job is VIP protection taxi violence unit. When you do this job, you need to, uh, to be trained. Sometimes you need to, to be brave in your mind, focus when you're doing. Sometimes when it's at night, we're working with the client, we're at night in the danger zone. Sometimes the hitman, they're waiting for him. That's my biggest risk. We buy taxes to make business. We don't buy taxes to become gangsters or to become hooligans. Our interest is to transport people from point A to point B. Hey, what for you? I'm trying to. Then I have a police officer rank. As a team leader, Sam, we have two tools. We have one rank. So she and I are always in the same bridge. We tell you what Sam is doing. We make. Check the corner. I am a toilet. I am a everything. Yeah, in this place, we see them plenty of fire, like AK-47, like a driver. Sometimes the drivers, they carry them because they're fighting each other. Some of the gun, they steal from, a, from the home and the police station. We find that they come from security, but not to us. Because we train, we know everything, what we do to the rank. Always the time we are focusing. I want to speak to the man first.
The shootout claimed the life of the alleged hitman. Following an anonymous tip off, police responded swiftly. The taxi shootout began when two conflicting taxi associations got into a fight. You've got so many arms caches that are still lying all over the country. Police stations that have been robbed. So weapons are everywhere. It's like an like an open ATM. If you're looking at your cash and transit heists, your armed robberies, your, your hijackings, your follow home robberies, your bank robberies, all of those involve uh, a significant amount of firepower. It affects so many aspects of crime in the country. In South Africa, the small arms survey in 2018 estimated that there were more than 2.3 million unlicensed firearms in the country. Where do the sources of those firearms come from? Over the last 15 or so years, the South African Police Service has lost more than 26,000 police issue firearms. So those are firearms issued to police officers. Only 18% of those have ever been returned. The police have what's called their SAPS 13 evidence stores. SAPS themselves have admitted to Parliament they cannot tell you how many weapons go missing from their stores. In 2016, Chris Prinsloo, a former police colonel, pleaded guilty to selling 2,400 guns to an arms dealer who sold them on to gangsters. Christian Prinsloo was sentenced to an effective 18 years in jail on charges of racketeering and corruption. The murder rate in Cape Town has doubled over the past 10 years, and that's because of weapons finding their way to gangsters. Now we're finding a similar situation in Mozambique particularly, where the armories are insecure and they're leaking out of there. There's a suspicion that some may be coming in through Zimbabwe. A high-profile investigator of the Cape Town Police's anti-gang unit has been shot and killed. Within the Central Firearm Registry, there's been massive corruption. A significant number of people have supposedly legal licenses obtained illegally. It's clear that we have lost the best of the best. Unfortunately, at the present moment, there are more questions than answers. When you're fighting that sort of war out there, you look after yourself. I think the, the more and the better firepower that you have, the better for you. In South Africa, you've got almost 23 people a day that are dying from firearm-related injuries and more than 120 people being injured a day. And I think what is happening with the illicit firearm trade, it compares to what is happening in some of your serious conflict zones. In our own competing space and the amount of firearms that have been constantly coming through, there's a risk which we live about on a daily basis. Is it worth it? Does it worry me? It's case by case. 